All right, let me introduce our two speakers. The first, uh, to my farthest left, um, Dr. Eric Sandgren. He and I got the memo to wear purple uh, tonight. <laughs> Uh, Eric was born in Wisconsin. He got his BA from UW in uh, zoology, biochemistry, and molecular biology. He then went to Penn and got both a, a veterinary medicine degree as well as a PhD in genetics. He started in UW around uh, 1993 or 94? 93? Okay. Um, and uh, in the School of Veterinary Medicine as an experimental pathologist in the Department of Pathobiological Sciences. And he studied genetic mechanisms of breast, pancreas, and liver cancer. He's still doing that, using genetically modified mice. And he's now an associate professor in that department. Uh, a couple years after he came to UW, he joined the Grad School Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. And he eventually became the vice chair and then the chair of that committee. And he was also, a little later, asked to chair the all-campus Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. Uh, nine years ago, he took over as acting director of the Research Animal Resources Center, which is the administrative unit responsible for oversight and support of the campus animal care and use program. Then Dr. Jeffrey Kahn, um, who's uh, got his Master's of Public Health and PhD, he's the inaugural Robert Henry Levy and Rita Rita Heck Levy Professor of Bioethics and Public Policy and the Deputy Director for Policy and Administration at the Johns Hopkins Berman Institute of Bio Bioethics. He works in a variety of areas of bioethics, exploring the intersection of ethics and health science policy, including human and animal research ethics, public health, and ethical issues in emerging biomedical technologies. Professor Kahn has served on numerous state and federal advisory panels, and he's currently chair of the Institute of Medicine Board on Health Sciences Policy. In 2011, he was chair of the Institute of Medicine Committee on the use of chimpanzees in biomedical and behavioral research. <coughs> Professor Kahn has published three books and over 115 articles in the bioethics and medical literature. He speaks frequently across the U.S. and around the world on a range of bioethics topics. Recent articles include Raising the Bar, the Implications of the IOM Report on the Use of Chimpanzees in Research, as well as lessons learned, challenges in applying current constraints on research on chimpanzees to other animals. His education includes a BA from UCLA, a PhD from Georgetown, and a Master's of Public Health from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. All right, here's just a word about the format, and then I will hand it over to Eric. What's going to happen is Eric's going to give a little presentation about the details of the protocol that we're all here to discuss and hear about. And then he's going to talk about why he thinks that the, the experiments called for by that protocol are ethically and scientifically justified. Then Jeff is going to give his view about the matter. And then there'll be a shorter time, about five minutes, where they each can reply to one another. At that point, I've been asked to ask a couple of questions of each of our speakers. Then we're going to take our break for just a minute. And then we'll have questions from from you all. Uh, and this is a brief outline of the presentation. I'm going to talk a bit about the experiment. Um, how many of you have some information or have heard something about the experiment uh, that we're talking about? Uh, okay, so a lot of you, most of you, and that's, that's both good news and bad news. Um, it's good news because you're paying attention to an important issue. Uh, it's bad news because a lot of what you may have heard is not accurate. So I'm going to spend the first five or so minutes describing the characteristics, the details of this experiment. Uh, after that, uh, I will talk about an ethical framework that's used by animal care and use committees to determine whether a project should go forward. Um, I uh, have been on animal care and use committees uh, for many years. I'm not anymore. I was not a voting member of either of the committees that reviewed this project, uh, but I did sit in on some of the discussions. And uh, I think the general framework that I'll outline uh, will give you an idea of why the committee voted uh, as it did. Um, Certainly there are a lot of areas where I'm hoping you will ask questions about this uh, as the evening goes on. So first, let's start with the experiment. Um, the experiment, and uh, I should have tested this first. This might not even be a, anyway, whatever. Um, the experiment is, is uh, illustrated here. I've presented a timeline that's based on uh, information that is in the protocol that describes this work. So this information has been publicly available for a long time. And it starts out at the top with two groups of monkeys. Um, and the, the group at the top, uh, 20 monkeys, are the, uh, 
form the control group, and those are raised for six months with their mothers. At that point, the animals are taken out and put with a new cage mate. Thank you, Rob. Are taken out and put with a new cage mate uh, in the general colony. Now, the other group is treated identically with one important difference. These animals are taken away from their mothers at the time of birth and are raised in a nursery. So they're attended to by humans, uh, they're fed and taken care, of for, uh, taken care of by humans for between three and six weeks until they reach the stage where they can regulate their own temperature and then they're paired with another monkey at the same age. At six months, they also are given a new pair and taken out into the general colony. And this really forms the crux of the experimental design. This procedure here, peer rearing or nursery rearing, um, is known to increase the level of anxiety in, in monkeys. And I'll talk more about what that means a little bit later on. Uh, and the purpose of these experiments, again, as I'll get to later on, is to compare animals with more anxiety with animals that have less anxiety. <laughs> All right, so what happens during the course of their life, and they will live for, uh, the dashed line here uh, means that there's some variability, they will live for anywhere from up to one year to a year and a half. And during that time, they will experience a number of tests that evaluate the extent of their anxiety. Uh, and these are listed here. Um, I'm not going to go into them in a lot of detail. Certainly, we can talk about those more later uh, when there are questions. Uh, there's this series of HBPM. This is uh, a human intruder paradigm. And that just basically means that a person walks into the room that the monkeys are in and stands looking away from the monkey. The monkey would be where you're sitting and then the behavior of that monkey is observed. Um, and after that, the animal is anesthetized, a blood sample is taken to measure the level of stress hormone, and a PET scan is given, and that actually measures activity in specific brain regions um, that are known to be activated during stress. And that's followed in a number of days by an MRI magnetic resonance imaging, and that just gives some indication of the structure of the brain. Right, so that's repeated a number of times when the animal's young, a couple of other times as it's older. In addition to that, there are two examples where there's cerebral spinal fluid that's collected along with blood. There's one case where a skin biopsy is taken, and then there are a series of behavioral tests. Uh, and these, are, these include uh, test cage behavior, where an animal is just put into a new cage, the same as its other cage, and it's watched. Um, this conspecific behavior, that's where it's put into a new cage with another monkey, and their interactions are assessed. And uh, then there's uh, also a play cage behavior, where their, uh, their actions in a cage that is larger and more complex are evaluated. And then there's the, the famous S, the snake uh, visibility test that's been getting a lot of attention. Uh, this is not a snake thrown into the cage. This is um, a snake that's in its own cage outside of the animal's cage, and the animal can view it, and its behavior, again, is evaluated. And all these tests are designed in one way or another to basically document the level of anxiety that these animals have in different situations, and the hypothesis being that these animals will be more anxious. And then at the end of the study, the animals are killed, and tissue is collected, brain tissue. So um, pieces of the brain will be taken out and analyzed. I'll talk about that more. So that's the basic experimental design. This is what we're talking about. Now, how do we go about determining whether something like this is ethical, um, whether it should move forward and be performed? Um, and in order to do that, uh, the, the animal care and use committees, which have the responsibility for approving uh, or not approving um, uh, experiments before they occur, uh, perform a utilitarian ethical analysis uh, where an action is considered ethical if it maximizes the net amount of welfare. In order to make that assessment, the committee needs to know what are the potential benefits, what are the potential harms, and what possible alternatives are there that might accomplish the same objective. Each of those has to be addressed by the investigator, and the committee evaluates that. Um, the, um, the ethical process then, or uh, the decision is actually made by the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. That's a group <coughs> of individuals that has to include at least a veterinarian, a scientist, 
a non-scientist and, uh, and a public member not affiliated with the institution. Um, and UW-Madison can't ever do things the regular way, so we have five IACOOKs, and there's a total of 60 members <coughs> of those IACOOKs. Um, and, and they perform a balancing test. They balance the potential benefits against the potential costs. They determine whether there are alternatives, and then make a decision. So let's go through that process. I'm going to show you how I would look at this. Uh, and give you an, give you a sense for um, in this case what the benefit the specific benefits are and what the costs are. All right. So experimental rationale and objectives. You've got to know at the start what the point of the study is, uh, and and it has to do with anxiety disorders and depression. These are common, um, and they frequently originate uh, in childhood. Dr. Kalin, who is proposed to perform these experiments, uh, and others have identified regions in the monkey brain. Uh, have identified brain regions that underlie anxiety and depression in both monkeys and humans. Turns out these areas are very similar to each other. So these areas become active, hyperactive actually, in very anxious individuals. The purpose of this specific experiment is to then go into those areas of the brain, take out the tissue, and identify brain chemicals and changes in gene expression that underlie this hyperactivity. That's the purpose of this experiment. <coughs> the reason that they want to do that is that once you've identified pathways that may be active and underlying anxiety, that gives you a target to work against to try to control the anxiety. Um, targets for therapy and or prevention. And it is an important issue. It's an important problem. This is one of the things that the committees uh, are uh, definitely take into account. Um, so, so worldwide, and in this country too, if you look at the causes of disability, that is failure to, to function normally in the environment, psychiatric conditions are the number one cause. So um, it's an important problem at least, a uh, widespread problem. That's something, again, the committees need to know. All right, can the study succeed? Is it designed in such a way that it might actually provide us some information that could be useful to address the problem? Well, I'm going to give you an example uh, and, and show how this has worked in another case and then talk about why I think it can work in this case. So rational drug design starts with knowledge of a specific biological target. And remember, that's the purpose of these experiments, to identify biological targets in regions of the brain that are known to be involved in anxiety. Then they create a molecule that can affect that. This little cartoon shows the sort of a thing. Here's an enzyme, a substrate can bind to it, and then when they're together, there's some activity that occurs that uh, would not occur when they're not together. Um, and the idea is to try to mimic that. If we want to increase the activity here, we find something that keeps this substrate stuck longer. If we're trying to block it, we find something that sits in this spot so the substrate can't bind. Seroton selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, were discovered using uh, rational drug design. And it was based on the finding that depletion of serotonin, which is uh, a neurotransmitter, a chemical neurotransmitter that <coughs> mediates this talk between neurons, um, that, that, that low depletion of serotonin was associated with depression. So here's a target. And, um, the question was, can we identify something that can raise those levels? And uh, in fact, the SSRIs were identified. Uh, they include fluoxetine, or the more commonly known as Prozac, the first one. Um, and uh, a, a large analysis of multiple studies of fluoxetine demonstrated that it works for many people, not all people, but many people, to treat depression. Uh, and in, uh, 2011, in 2011, over 130 million prescriptions were written in the U.S. for this class of drugs. Um, so it's something that's, that's used very widely. Um, and, and this gives us a sense, gives us an example of how learning the identity of biological targets makes it possible to create drugs that can alter those targets. So the general approach outlined in the experiment we're talking about now is a good approach. It can succeed has succeeded. If it does succeed, will it matter? Well, let's go into a little more detail in that, uh, that uh, first psychiatric disorder slide I showed. So uh, this, uh, this is a, a chart showing the prevalence of anxiety disorders. And this is just 
over the course of a single year in the United States. Uh, so in any year, uh, and this is in percentage uh, of adults, in any year about 55 million people are affected, 12 million people are severely affected, and the current therapies, and that includes the SSRIs, that includes uh, other forms of therapy, non-drug therapy, those are only a third effective. One third of the individuals are partly helped, and another third of the individuals are not helped at all. So about 18 million affected and 4 million severely affected people don't respond at all to current therapies. So <coughs> even if a, a uh, well, and let's, let's look a little further specifically at depression, um, which is in some cases the more serious, this shows the percent, again, 12-month pre uh, prevalence. Uh, about 7% of people in the United States have a major depressive episode over the course of a year. Uh, it's higher in women uh, and it's, it's higher in uh, younger people. And these are the kinds of events that occur during these major depressive episodes. It's not just, boy, I'm feeling bad, I'm kind of depressed today. Uh, frequent thoughts of death, suicidal thoughts, suicide attempts, violence, um, uh, slowed thinking, speaking, or body movements, difficulty concentrating, making decisions, and remembering things. In other words, the functioning of these people is seriously impaired. So, so even if we can only treat, even if we can find a treatment that only is effective on a small number or a small percent of those people, that still ends up being a very large total benefit. So the committees and, and I, as we're assessing this, look at this and say, okay, this represents the benefits, potentially very large. But you can't stop there. You have to talk about the cost, and the cost is to the animals in the study. The study itself is designed to create monkeys with increased anxiety. Uh, the study <coughs> procedures themselves will produce some stress, and 40 monkeys, in the end, will be euthanized. So what, what are the different aspects of cost? Well, the, the creation of stress is, uh, is, is performed by the uh, peer rearing, and I've talked a little bit about that already. I want to point out that it's a standard husbandry procedure when a mother monkey rejects her offspring and there's no foster mother available. So this will happen sometimes. The alternative to peer rearing would be to have that animal die. Um, peer rearing does have effects on animals. I've talked a little bit about that. And in fact, that's why it's being used in this case. <coughs> uh, if you look at the behavior of the animals, you see that they show increased toe and finger sucking. This is thought to be very much like thumb sucking in human individuals, in human children. Uh, it provides a sort of comfort. But what about more serious effects? Um, one of the things that, uh, that is potentially of concern would be if there would be self-injurious behavior, if an animal would bite at itself, or pull out a, a lot of its hair, injure itself in some way, uh, similar in, in, in human populations to children who cut themselves. And uh, of 158 monkeys that were peer reared at the primate center here over the 12-year uh, period, um, uh, only one of, and these were all reared this way because the mother rejected them and there was no foster. So these weren't experimental, uh, uh, experimentally set up. Uh, only one showed self-injurious behavior before the age of a year and a half, and that's how long the animals in this study will live. She's not normal now. They are able to treat that very often. Uh, and has an infant of her own. So we're not talking about a serious increase in anxiety or a serious problem here. Peer rearing is considered to produce mild to moderate increase in anxiety compared to mother rearing. Uh, the procedures themselves have costs, and we can look at uh, the different procedures and their <coughs> frequency. Uh, so uh, once every two months on average, and these aren't grouped, sometimes they're closer, sometimes they're farther apart, I'm just dividing uh, 12 months by the number of times the procedure is, is performed. Um, there's that trilogy of the human intruder paradigm, uh, blood draw and PET scan, and then that's followed a little bit later by the MRI. That's the most common. Once every six months, there will be blood draws with a CSF tap, and those are with anesthesia and analgesia. And then the behavior tests, uh, test cage, play cage, the conspecific behavior. And then once per 12 months, there is a skin biopsy, and the view of a snake in a separate cage. So the procedures themselves, are their purpose is to measure the animal's response to stressful situations. Uh, so they cause some stress. But I do want to point out that each of the individual procedures, even showing a live snake uh, or perhaps a, a live spider, 
Each of those are performed in certain cases uh, in, in human testing or clinical uh, trials. Um, so none of the procedures are, are sort of outside the realm of, of what is something that humans might experience also. And I also want to talk about what the study is not. These are some of the claims that have been made in, and I'm putting in the quotes, about this study. And these are inaccurate. So it's not a total isolation. Uh, the surrogate materials in the nursery don't provoke heightened anxiety. They actually reduce anxiety. It's not torture. It's not relentless fear. It's not panic-inducing tests. Um, it is not serious psychological torment. Uh, it's not the pit of despair um, or other severe procedures that Harry Harlow uh, is known to have performed here uh, quite a number of years ago. It doesn't maximize animal suffering. With respect to the scientific design itself, it's not archaic, outdated, crude, or redundant. Um, and it's certainly not without any potential payoff in terms of finding cures. So if you see a petition or a letter um, or a description of these studies using these words, you can basically recognize that that is an inaccurate description. So alternatives. We've got to consider whether there are alternatives. And, and when we say alternatives, we mean ways of getting the same information, but not using uh, the monkeys in this way. So uh, I'm showing here the different ways that disease can be studied. We can, can look at it all the way from the population level, and that's epidemiology, uh, down through the individual, uh, organs, tissues, cells, parts of cells, to molecules and genes. And remember, this particular study is trying to get information in this area. What are the genes and the molecules that influence anxiety and that might be targets to try to modulate anxiety? Um, so uh, you can't use test tubes or computer simulations in a case like this because you, you require a functioning, living individual. Uh, and you also can't use humans. Um, epidemiology and imaging uh, as a, a, epidemiology doesn't work, it's not an epidemiological issue, and the imaging doesn't work because we don't know what the molecules are that are here, so we can't image them. Um, another important reason we can't use humans is because uh, early uh, life experiences need to be controlled, so we have these two groups of animals that differ only in one way. You can't use rodents anatomically and behaviorally, they're relatively different in how anxiety works. Uh, and, and monkeys and humans share features of brain anatomy and functioning and of anxious behavior. Monkeys are a very close model for human anxiety and its associated disease. And that's really the crux of the issue, isn't it? The reason we want to use monkeys is because they're similar to humans. The reason we don't want to use monkeys is because they're similar to humans. So it's a, it's a tough issue. So my utilitarian equation, here is how I put this together. So I, I look at the benefits. Uh, I expect it's, I, I feel it's likely that this study will identify brain chemicals and changes in gene function involved in anxiety. Once we have those then, they become the targets for therapy or prevention. The next step then would be to take those targets, and we can't do this next step unless we know what those are, and use, and, and try to develop this evidence-based uh, treatments for some of the millions of people that are affected by debilitating <coughs> anxiety disorders. Uh, and depression. Potential costs. We're housing monkeys in a colony or laboratory setting. A lot of individual, a lot of people think that in itself is wrong uh, and is a cost to the animal, so I want to be sure to include that. We're inducing a mild to moderate dis uh, increase in anxiety in 20 monkeys. We're subjecting 40 monkeys and their mothers to uh, moderate stress. And finally, we're killing those monkeys at the end of the study. Mm -hmm. Alternatives, there really are no alternatives available that can answer the precise question that's being asked in this case. So on balance, um, based on this information, I conclude that the, process, the project is ethical and I would approve it. And this is the conclusion that two uh, animal care and use committees on this campus reach. Although it was after months of deliberation, uh, many requested modifications in the protocol, um, and the final vote <coughs> was uh, un unanimous to approve in one case and five to two to approve in the other case. And I would go even further uh, in, 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 um, in light of the subtitle that was on the poster, uh, and, and I would say considering the magnitude of the problem that we're dealing with here, um, 
I believe it would be unethical not to go forward with this study. If you don't do the study, then you lose the possibility of gaining those particular benefits. That's all for now. Thank you. Thank you. Is this on? Have you guys got it up and going? Good. So thank you for the uh, invitation and uh, opportunity. Uh, one of the things that wasn't in my uh, short bio is that I uh, taught for five years at the Medical College of Wisconsin. So, and my children actually are both born in Milwaukee. So I guess I come by some Wisconsin uh, loyalty naturally. It's good to be here um, in Madison, and it's good to see such a, a large audience and interested crowd in what's an important and controversial area. I think many of you in the room know much more about the specific, specifics of this study than, than do I. So I'm going to do my best to uh, speak to some of the specifics, but also speak about some of the general issues that I see raised by it and by research like it. So, you, you may have um, intuited from some of the um, comments so far that the ethics of research has really focused on the ethical acceptability of the moral balancing or, or really a trade-off between harm to animal subjects, so harms of the sort um, that you just heard um, Eric articulate, uh, not, not only but including um, stressful situations and, and death in the case of the euthanized animals in return for benefits to human health. So at this point I think it, it makes sense for me to sort of point out one of the issues that, that um, Eric raised in relation to utilitarianism as a way of balancing risks and benefits and seeking a, appropriate such balancing. Uh, of course that's a, a appropriate and well um, used and, and very well studied uh, way to think about um, moral philosophy. But distribution of the harms and benefits also matters. So we think about utilitarian balancing um, in human populations and we think we want to maximize benefit and minimize harm. When we talk about maximizing the benefit for one group, in this case humans, um, for at, at the cost of harm to animals, it's not quite the fair application of utilitarian moral philosophy. Of course, that is the way that um, regulation and the ethics of animal research in this country has been set up. So it's, it's understandable that we would come to the conclusions that we do. I would say at this point, though, just because research can be performed in ways that are consistent with requirements, requirements that, that ask us to balance harms and benefits, it doesn't necessarily follow that it is ethically acceptable research. So you can do research in ways that meet the, the rules and the requirements, but you have to step back and ask whether um, the research ought to be permissible at all. So how would we judge that? Before I get to that answer, let me just say, again, to reiterate a little bit, the responsibility for evaluating the balance, and, and um, Eric's done a good job of, of articulating that for us, has evolved really on the part of um, IACUCS into a management of the suffering of animal subjects. How do we minimize suffering for the benefits that we hope the research will yield? And the question of whether those benefits are sufficient tends to be very difficult for IACUCS to assess. They should do that, and they're required to do that, but they often lack the expertise that allows them to dig deeply into the details that would help them answer that question. So I will, without knowing the details of the discussion here at, at the University of Wisconsin, I will tell you in my experience as a member of an IACUC, although I haven't been one in a number, been on an IACUC in a number of years, I have had some years of experience, the claim of benefits is largely accepted at face value or as a matter of faith in the biomedical research enterprise by IACUCS. So it is an important 
area that needs to be dug into, but I think one that's very difficult for the institutional committees that are charged with doing so. Just to take this out of the animal context for half a, a minute. I, um, now, many years ago, uh, visited China for, me, for the first time for me. It was probably 15 years ago. And I went to China every year for seven or eight years and, and to talk about ethics of research on human subjects. And one of the proposals that they asked us to, to talk about was uh, a randomized controlled trial where large populations in a city in China were uh, given in their, in their bread ration, um, bread that had been um, augmented with folic acid and bread that had not. From a public health perspective, we've known for a very long time that folic acid helps prevent neural tube defects in children. And we were quite surprised that they felt that it was necessary, getting to the point here, to do a randomized controlled trial, something that was widely understood as a as good public health practice. You want to reduce the um, prevalence and incidence of neural tube defects in children. You make sure there's folic acid in their diet, and the best way, easy way to do that is in flour. So we huddled the group of us who were American academics and tried our best to articulate to them that we felt that this was duplicative. <coughs> unnecessary and therefore unethical research. So the, the question when it comes to the use of animals is a similar one, I think. How do we decide that research is necessary to perform? Not that it would be useful. It would be useful to know whether folic acid reduces neural defects in Chinese population, but is it necessary to do that research to know what the answer in public health terms was. The same kind of question should be asked and I think addressed for animal research in this country and in this particular case. I think it's um, important to step back again for half a moment and talk a little bit about why uh, I, I think it's important to talk about necessity and its application to research. So research is often justified on the argument that it will yield results that will advance scientific understanding. We've heard that human health or a combination of both, hopefully. That is, that it's necessary in order to realize those benefits. But we can't stop there. We need to ask, well, what, what would that mean? It's also just not responsible at a time of increasingly tight NIH and other funders funding uh, that research that is unnecessary is a poor use of resources and, and wasteful, and therefore, I think, um, ethically indefensible. We can't afford, either financially, fiscally, or ethically, to allow unnecessary research to go forward. So what would satisfy the criteria of necessity? I'll try to bring this back to the study at hand at some point, as you'll see, so bear with me. So to help answer the question of what counts as necessity in the context of biomedical research, I'm going to um, take you back to the committee that you heard I chaired um, as part of the introduction. So I, I had the uh, good fortune of chairing an Institute of Medicine committee that was asked uh, to establish criteria for when it would be necessary to use chimpanzees in biomedical or behavioral research. Without boring you with the details of how we got to this answer, here's what we concluded. And this will sound actually very similar to what you saw on some of the, the slides of a few minutes ago. One, and these three have to all be true, so one, two, and three. One, there's no other suitable model. So we can't do the research in question with any other, presumably lower, animal model. No in vitro model, and we heard that that was the case here. No computer modeling or no other non-human in vivo model that is lower than the one in question. And of course, that's often what the IA Cook is asked to opine about. That's one. Second, that the research in question cannot be performed ethically on human subjects. Now, we saw a little glim uh, glimpse of that in the slides. This was a relevant um, criterion to add to the question about um, chimpanzee research because so much of the research that was funded on chimpanzees had to do with human health. 
we heard, and that's why I asked to leave the pie chart here, that this is also about treating human health. And so we have to ask, well, if we want to understand human health, why are we not first trying to study humans? Which seems like an obvious thing, but in fact, from the perspective of the decisions about when and how to use animals, almost never asked. Third, and maybe the, the most important for the rest of the discussion, is that the use of the animal species in, in question is required right, in order to achieve the goal which has to be, in the case of the chimpanzee committee, has to be to accelerate the prevention, control, and or treatment of potentially life-threatening or debilitating diseases. So a very high bar. So not just important for human health, not just required in order to achieve the, the answer to the question you're asking about human health, but the human health condition has to be sufficiently important to justify the use of this animal species. So very high bar. So two more points, and then I'll try to get to the answer to the question about this particular study. Buried in all of this discussion about necessity and that ethics and necessity go together is a um, implicit claim that moral status matters, that some animals deserve greater moral respect than do others. So the IOM committee was asked to opine about the use of chimpanzees because there is a view that they are more like us, that's why they're important to be used, but by their being more like us, it troubles us on an ethics basis in a, in a way that's different than the use of a rodent, say. You may not agree with that, but that is the way the system has been set up. So as we talk about animals that are higher on the phylogenetic scale, as, as have higher moral status without arguing for what that exactly would mean, the bar is higher, so the argument goes. And so the same kinds of reasoning that go to why we must use rhesus in the case of trying to understand biological markers for anxiety and depression, the same reasons they're, they're useful as animal models is the same reason why the using them raises moral issues. And the justification has to be sufficiently high to counter that concern of their moral status. So would we be having a rhetorical question to you all? Would we be having the same conversation if the animal model in question were a rat instead of a rhesus macaque? Okay. That's a really important question. And if we can do the same work with a, with a rat, then we certainly should on the argument that their moral status is somehow less. So let me now try to turn to the research at hand. Some of this I um, gleaned from my preparation in, in coming to tonight, and some of it I took from um, the presentation. So bear with me if I'm not as organized as I might otherwise be. One thing that struck me is that, maybe obvious, but let me say it anyway, that the details really matter as do the, their descriptions. So the language that we use matters a lot. So if you say that anxiety is increased, does that mean that they're just a little more stressed than they otherwise be, or does it mean that they're sh shaking in terror? Those are really different things. And I know you answered that question, but it's hard for me to know what the objective answer to that is. It's clearly not normal conditions for these um, animal subjects because if it were, they wouldn't be involved in the research. The reason that you're causing them stress is because it's an abnormal state of their, their being. Second, in relation to the details, is the number of procedures. So the first slide you, you showed related to the timeline and the numbers of things that were done over what period in the protocol. And I don't know how to answer this question, but I think it's worth trying to get an answer about it. At what point do the numbers of procedures 
become unnecessary, move from necessary to answer the research question to being just too many and too much and more stress than is warranted. So there's a kind of quantity question to be answered, which I think is very hard for non-scientists to know how to evaluate. And that's part of the frustration. We don't have access to the level of facts and details and description that will help answer what seems to be a really important question to me. I don't know where we are in the numbering. So next, I will say rather than try to give you a number. I find it an interesting claim, and I know it's one that biomedical research is increasingly engaged in, to go from identification of molecular targets in non-human animal models to claims about treating a psychiatric disease that affects a large proportion of the world's population. The, the connection is not as linear as, unfortunately, as researchers would indicate. There are many steps between identification of molecular targets and drugs on the market or treatments that are made available. And so um, I think we have to be careful and acknowledge that um, between here and there are many steps which include research involving human subjects. So um, one of the things that I think is often overlooked is to say we want to use animal subjects so we don't have to use human subjects, it's just not the case. We use human subjects, but maybe in a, in a later or different stage in the research. And that's just important to say. The last point, and then I guess I'll try to wrap up in whatever way I can get my head to do that. Um, I think it's easy to justify as necessary research when the, the question is asked in so precise a way that there is no other answer. And I think you probably didn't intend in your comments to, to um, sort of hand this to me, but you said to, to answer the pre precise question that is being asked, this is the only way to do it. And I, I wonder whether um, by focusing on such precision, we set it up in a way that there is no other um, answer but to say this research is necessary. I guess the bigger question is, is that the right question to be asking? Um, before I came in t tonight, somebody asked me, um, do you agree or disagree? Do you object to, do you approve of this study? And I answered, and I think I'm going to just use the same answer here, I'm deeply skeptical about the necessity in the way that I have articulated it um, of this study. And if it isn't necessary, then it isn't ethically acceptable. And with that, I'll stop. Well, I, I'm, I'm really happy uh, with what I heard, because these are all really important issues. Um, there are issues that I think about. In, in five minutes to describe the study and ten minutes to describe how I came to an ethical conclusion, obviously I had to leave a lot of things out. Um, and, and I think Jeff really kind of focused on what some of those are. So I'd like to answer some of those questions, uh, address them as best I can, uh, and I'll kind of go through the list. So uh, he started out by talking about when we consider balance, uh, the, the ethical utilitarian balance, that the distribution matters um, if the benefits are to one species and the costs are to another species. And, and I agree, um, it matters. So how much does it matter? I, I don't know that we're really going to be able to address that one tonight because it's a huge issue. It really depends on how you view animals with respect to humans. How are they similar? How are they different? When does an animal get enough moral status so that they have rights, the same as humans grant ourselves, to uh, be excluded from a study that doesn't benefit them, even if it, there's a cost to the greater good? So I, I, maybe we'll pursue this later on, but I'll only say we draw lines. We all of us draw lines when we think of different species. And where we draw them is really important and has has tremendous consequences. Um, if you believe that that animals are not, if you believe that it's appropriate to use animals for some studies, uh, in, in this case a relatively small number <coughs> of animals, to help potentially help a very great number of humans, then you're going to say this is it's okay, it's it's all right that the distribution is different. If you don't believe that, you won't say that. And I'm not really sure we can go much further 
with that right now. Um, uh, Jeff also pointed out that sometimes uh, IACUCs may lack the expertise to evaluate the balance. Um, certainly that's a, that's a tough issue. We're helped out in many cases when a scientific review has been performed before it comes to the IACUC. So right now, grant funding is very difficult to get. Uh, only the best of the best protocols, as assessed by physicians and scientists working in the field, actually get funded. This study was approved uh, by a study section. And that tells us, at least, that the scientific experts in that area believe that uh, there's great value to the study, that it's appropriately designed, um, and that there uh, is, is a potential for a payoff. Um, and, and I also have to say that it, the, my experience with the IACUCs here, and particularly in this discussion, where uh, discussion of this protocol, which went on for about eight different meetings, some single meetings of committees, some combined, this, that was one of the issues that was raised. Um, so, so we recognize as members of a committee that we may not be expert in an area, but we do have access to resources and can bring information to the discussion. Uh, and I'm generally very pleased with how that works on this campus, at least as far as I've experienced it. Um, how do we decide if the research is necessary? Uh, the criteria of necessity. Um, and and it, 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 you know, there, there, were, there were several issues that, uh, um, uh, several ways in, in, in which he, uh, Jeff talked about that. Um, and, and I would point out, so, so actually let me read this. Okay, so defining uh, uh, necessity and unnecessary. Uh, we don't want to do uh, unnecessary work, uh, wasteful. Um, and what are the criteria? There's no other suitable model. Um, uh, it can't be performed ethically on human subjects. And then use of the species is required to achieve the particular goals. Those, those were three of the, uh, the things that Jeff mentioned. Uh, and with respect to no other suitable model, uh, again, in the context of the question that's being asked, and, and that was an issue Jeff raised at the end, I'll get to that in a minute, um, uh, in, this is the, the, the only suitable model. Um, given the similarities between these animals and, and the, the humans. So we, we do believe that, that there is no other suitable model to answer this particular question. Um, it cannot be performed ethically on human subjects. Well, what we do actually on this campus pay a lot of attention to uh, research with human subjects. So um, as much money is spent here uh, to fund research that's associated with an institutional review board review, an IRB uh, review, and that is what is done for human studies, as is spent uh, on research that is required to have an animal care and use committee approval. So, so there's, again, we're using humans and studies on this campus very often. We are aware of this, and we really do try to match the study to the species that's used. In this case, the requirement to euthanize the animals at the end of the study means we can't use humans. Um, and then the use of the species is required to achieve the goal. Again, the, the, I've talked about uh, how uh, the monkeys are very similar uh, in certain ways to the humans. Um, all right, so uh, in terms of this research in, in particular, the, the details matter, uh, and, and, and I agree with that. Uh, we need to define, for instance, the level of anxiety. Um, and and that is something that uh, was, was certainly difficult for me and the committees. And in order to assess that, uh, I tried to get an objective answer. I presented some of that data. I also talked to a veterinarian who works with these animals. And that gave me some background. Um, but, but I absolutely agree that, that uh, when we talk about anxiety, we really need to consider the level of anxiety, what that really means. The committees have to pay attention to that. I feel in this case that they did. Um, the number of procedures. Are there too many procedures? When do we say, okay, that's enough, it should stop? Uh, and and you, you've got to really match, you, you, you've got to justify in a case like this where you're performing multiple procedures why you're going to do that. And that actually was done in the protocol. So many of those tests were performed at developmental stages that match very specific stages in, in human children. 
So there was a rationale behind that. In the context of the protocol, all those procedures were justified. You can still decide that you think that's too many procedures, but at least there was a reason for all of them uh, that was presented in the protocol. Um, uh, the, the, the statement that there is perhaps a, a very long distance between finding biochemical targets and uh, treating a human disease, um, I, I absolutely agree. Uh, and just because you find the targets doesn't mean you will find a way to treat those diseases. So that's, that's absolutely correct. But I would point out that if you don't have those targets, then you're guaranteed to fail. Um, uh, you only might fail if you do have the targets. So not, uh, if you don't do that first step, none of the, none of the other steps matter at all. Um, and then, uh, do we need to answer this precise question? Jeff asked if the way I framed the uh, argument might uh, be a, a little, um, uh, might bias the answer. And that's an issue that I wrestle with because so often I hear people saying, well, we could answer that question very easily. So for example, with respect to this study, uh, people have said, just do a literature search on uh, uh, humans, and MRI and anxiety, and you'll find a thousand papers that show that you can use MRI to study anxiety. Well, that's not the kind of study we're referring to here. So I try to be maybe overly cautious uh, when, I, when I point out that you really have to consider the specific question, but your point is absolutely correct. If you frame the question too carefully uh, or, or too finely, then you, you, know, you, you set up a situation where you've really answered the question for itself. And you have to be cautious not to do that. You have to look at the objectives and say, really, can we get this information, if not through the same experimental design, can we get it in another way? Um, I feel in this case that the study was done, uh, that, that this was justified fairly well, but certainly there's uh, room for discussion there. Sorry. Thanks. Um, I want to really just take on two, two general areas rather than a kind of, you know, point by point. One, I think we have to be careful about how much uh, to invest in uh, because peer review says it's worth doing that it's worth doing. Uh, to draw again on the chimpanzee experience, which at least is some factual um, information that bears on this question. And, and you were at the talk earlier where I, I uh, discussed this. So that, that committee, which is made up of mostly scientists, um, and I was the only um, non-scientist, but we looked at the, at the 10 years from 2000 to 2010 uh, at the research that had been approved and was funded by the NIH involving chimpanzees. And almost none of it was deemed to meet the criteria of necessity. Which, which should give us all pause, frankly. It's expensive, it's burdensome on animals. I mean, it's, it's, not a, it's not a good answer. It's not a good finding. It does not make me feel good, actually, that that was what we discovered. And so I, I worry about saying because there's been scientific review or peer review that that somehow answers the question. And I don't, I don't have good um, insight into why that's not working exactly as we would hope, but I think we can't leave it at, at that. So without putting too fine a point on it. There's some evidence that it doesn't work as well as we might hope. And then I would ask, and again, this is, I don't know, an answerable question, but s sometimes um, it, it may be the case that it's a, a most efficient way to answer what we take to be a necessary question. But that doesn't mean it's the only way. And again, this, this came um, up in the chimpanzee example where we, we could be quicker and probably cheaper to uh, find an answer to an important human health question by using chimpanzees, but it could be found out, say, using human subjects. It just would take longer and cost more. And I think we have to ask whether expediency is a sufficient answer to um, whether we can or can't justify the use of a particular animal subject or animal population in research. And I think that's actually a, a, a higher level question that isn't an IACUC question, but one that we ought to think about as we ponder what the acceptable use of, of animals are for human purposes. Uh, Norm Faust, uh, I'm the faculty here. Uh, Steve Sumi, one of uh, Harry Harlow's disciples, gave a talk here 40 years ago to the Department of Pediatrics and said the reason it's important to use monkeys for these studies, infant depression and anxiety, 
is because the monkeys are so similar to the humans and we can trust, have a high degree of trust that what we find in them will be extendable. Um, and in fact, he said he, from his studies, they seem to react exactly the same way human infants do, behaviorally, chemically, hormonally, everything that happens to the monkeys seems to be what we know also about human infant depression. And I asked him then, if that's the case, then why not use humans? And the answer was, well, because it causes too much suffering. Yeah. Well, if it's too much suffering for humans, why isn't it too much suffering for the animals? If as far as we can tell, it's pretty much exactly the same. And I haven't gotten an answer to that. <laughs> We're going to hold off on the applause. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Right, ten seconds left to make a comment. Did I use my whole minute? You can, no, you got ten seconds. <laughs> all of the organizers and all of the speakers are friends and colleagues, and I just think it took tremendous courage for all of them to organize this and do it in a civil manner where there hasn't been any appeal to emotions. So I, I commend everybody for that, and I hope we can continue to maintain that atmosphere. Okay. That's worth a clap. Actually, in my answer, I was going to appeal to emotion, but now I can't. So. <laughs> That's not fair. Um, so, so, an outstanding question, and, and I think the answer is embedded somewhere in, the answer that each of us would get is embedded somewhere in our sense for what other animals are like in relationship to us. So what is a monkey compared to a human? Um, if you consider them to be equivalent in relevant moral ways, then it, you would not let this happen to those animals. If you consider them to be different in morally relevant ways, even if they're similar, if you consider them to be different, then you could allow something like that to happen. I, I don't know that I want to, or even could, go into a real detailed description of what are the morally relevant differences, but I do know that there's a, a great deal of, there are many different opinions on that. I do not feel that monkeys are the same as humans in certain ways that would allow me to decide it's okay in a case like this to do it. I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for, but it, I think it really is based on how we view other species. Well, um, because Can I have say something really to speak, quick. I want to allow the both of you to answer yeah, your questions just directed to something. So, so I, mean, I think it depends, Norm, in um, whether it requires doing a controlled anxiety provoking experiment on human children, right? And so the way you asked the question made it sound like, well, there are enough children that are experiencing this sort of stress, why don't we study them? And if that's the case, I, I, I totally agree with you. So that strikes me as an example where we could do the research on human subjects in a way that, that answers the question about whether it's necessary to use rhesus or some other non-human primate species. Um, very quickly, I, I was at a, another meeting where Steve Sumi now, 40 years later, um, gave a presentation about his ongoing work. So he, he is, his work is at uh, NIH. There's a large colony of macaque at uh, Poolsville, Maryland. And the, the people he was speaking to were actually biodemographers, which is a, a combination of demography and biology, an interesting area. Um, and they were his peers who were extraordinarily uncomfortable that his research was continuing to look at things that they thought had been long ago decided. So I, I, I don't know. It feels like there's a, a, a growing sense of, that the peers don't believe that his work, it's different than this work, um, needs to continue. And the fact that he can't answer the question 40 years later, I think, is indicative of a, of a problem. Hi, um, my name is Heather Rosenfeld. I'm a grad student in the geography department. And I, I don't have a question. I'd like to call for a minute of silence for the, um, our fellow primates whose lives um, have or might be destroyed. Thank you. We're going to go with the next question, however. Um, so if I had um, a minute, can we say then the remaining 50 seconds that I didn't speak? No, what we're here to do is to hear our speakers respond to questions, I, ideally critical, tough questions. So I think this I, is like to critical. Move. This is a, it's not a critical question, however. Please ask your question. You know, my question addresses the experimental protocol 
You mentioned that this experiment is supposed to get at gene function <coughs> so that we can look at potential um, pharmaceutical treatments. And so my question is, is gene function going to change the tissue in a brain in a different way that the same genes that are present in the cells of the skin would not do so? Because if the answer to that is no, then we could do human research and we could be taking skin biopsies. We would eliminate that whole problem with the euthanasia of the monkeys for the purpose of getting at brain tissue. Okay, I, I can answer that. And, and the answer lies, lies in the way genes are expressed in different tissues. Every cell in the body has the same genes, but the pattern exp of expression varies tremendously, and that's what makes a neuron a neuron and a skin cell a, a skin cell. So the genes that will be expressed in those two are very different. Now, I will say, though, that you have suggested the basis for what I think will be a, a become an important line of investigation in the future. We're starting to learn how to take skin cells and turn them into neurons, and we're starting to do that with human tissues. Now, a single neuron is not a whole nervous system, but if you're trying to identify ways to change expression of genes in a single neuron, you can use those cultured neurons and you can use them from humans. So, so my answer is no, we can't right now perform these studies by using skin. Um, but quite frankly, I think it won't be long before similar studies to this might be performed in humans. So if that's the case, then I'm going to get at the, dupli dupli the duplication <laughs> of research. <laughs> you used a better word, duplicity, or something like that. And so, <laughs> Not duplicity. Um, Duplicative. Yeah, duplicity, that's it. Please. Um, <laughs> no. You mentioned that we developed Prozac. So have we already done gene function research when we developed that pharmaceutical and could we go back to that research instead of doing it again? Mm -hmm. So it was a different kind of research. It was a different target that was identified. It was serotonin levels in, in the brain. And so these SSRIs do raise the level of serotonin and, and control depression. But recall what I said, that only works in about a third of the people. A third are partially uh, uh, helped, and another third aren't helped at all. So probably there are multiple different biochemical pathways underlying depression. We understand one of them, Prozac treats that, but it doesn't touch the others. The goal here is to identify, if, to see if we can identify other pathways that are different than the one from Prozac. So we can't just go back to that. Or, good question. Though. Um, is that theory that in his treaty, the animal that therefore I am, um, writes that we'll continue to war on each other until we stop the, the war on animals? And in terms of application, he also writes about a concept of limitropy, providing a guiding methodology as a way of conceptualizing and circumventing these traditional metaphysical boundaries of the animal and human. And at the same time, it provides an opening or a clearing into some rather unimaginable unimaginable ways of considering communication. And so the chimpanzee communication system is presenting a discourse that's beyond words rather than lacking a discourse that possibly exists or exists interpretation or appropriation by human technologies or this practice of pure utility. Uh, the fiery gaze, the questioning eyes, the barks, the silence provide an encoded narrative that stimulates a path of source the sounds and the silences inside theory and practice that's transferred rather than translated into fixed meanings. And this transference marks non-human animals as resistant to explication, largely independent of intention and uniquely alive. So my question to you that I want to consider here, and do you see this idea of funding by the federal government that's clearly explained in these texts as an impetus to um, negate an ethics of care that permits that permits chimpanzees as be as re being recognized as beings in dynamic relationships that are deserving of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I do come to you as a dissertator and as an eighth grade teacher and UW instructor that teaches every day in my classrooms with two one of two of my German shepherds, and so I engage with. I engage with non-human animals in a way that has taught me very profound lessons 
about what they have to teach us. And if you look at military service dogs, how really way beyond, in many ways, the skills that we have. And so this hierarchy. I'm sorry, we're going to have to. Yeah. Concerns. We're going to have to allow this to answer the question. Thank you. Yeah. The only thing that comes to mind from your, your comment is the, um, the case that's making its way through courts in New York um, claiming rights of persons for chimpanzees as a kind of recognition of maybe some of the concepts that you're articulating. But I, I'm sorry to say I don't know the, the book that you're referring to, but maybe you, if you wouldn't mind giving me the site, I'd be interested in seeing what you're talking about. Well, I, ha I hate to, to say much good about the federal government right now because it's pretty dysfunctional. But in general, federal funding reflects the desire of the people in the country to spend money on certain things. So there are strong advocacy groups, patient advocacy groups, that want to see biomedical research move forward. Um, and there are strong animal activist groups that want to see animal-based research stop. Um, and I think the funding reflects a rough balance between those two. Um, so, so I believe that the funding represents the way uh, our society is viewing animals right now. You clearly have a particular one perspective, other people have a different perspective, and when you mix that all together, it comes out the other end as some funding but a lot of restrictions. That's, I think, the best I can do to answer your question. Could appropriate molecular targets be found by genetic analysis of people with inherited psychiatric disorders? Presumably the the, um, the thought is that we needn't test on non-human animals, but rather do genetic testing on those with an inherited psychiatric disorders. Definitely for you, not for me. Okay, <laughs> okay. So, so this gets at the issue of are there other ways, not identical to the yeah. one outlined here, um, but perhaps similar, that can give us some answers to the questions. And um, I think, in, in, in veterinary medicine and human medicine for forever, we've used people with genetic predispositions as a way to study <coughs> a disease. Now, what we're trying to do here is look at the specific molecules that are affected in the brain. And in humans, we really can't go, we can't kill them and go in and look. If we find something that's inherited in families, we can do genetic screening and identify a gene, or a, usually a gene, or a genetic locus that is, is involved, and that can give us a lot of clues. At one of the um, points of Dr. Kalin's study, though, is to look for, um, to differentiate between genetic causes of uh, anxiety and environmental causes of anxiety. So this case that was proposed here certainly could provide some information about genetic. I think that is reasonable. Um, the environmental side, though, it seems as though the mechanism is somewhat different than for the genetic side, uh, and so it probably wouldn't help us there. You know, I, I, I take back my, my def deference to uh, Eric. Um, there's an article today in the New York Times, I don't know if people read the paper today, about extreme responders to, to drugs. Um, really interesting, actually your, your comment made me think of this. So in, in some drug trials or introduction of new drugs, very few people respond, but some do. And those that do, really do respond and see therapeutic benefit. And so now there's work being done to try to understand the genetic um, particularities, so whatever's going on in those particular individuals that, that allows them to respond in ways that no one else does or very few others do. So it, it, I think we're heading towards a time when there's much more genetic and genomic information collected about all of us, big data approaches, lots of integration of clinical and genetic data that will allow some of the kinds of things that we're talking about in a way, you know, that will be population-based but also allow drilling down onto individuals in ways that very generalizable, very general research really won't get at some of the things that these specific genetic um, particularities will mm -hmm. apparently are, are at issue. So, I don't know, maybe it's not in replacement of, but in addition to some of the animal approaches. Um, during your presentation, you used the terms anxiety and depression as if they were interchangeable, and this struck me as false because <coughs> it seemed like they're significantly different disabilities. So if they are different, how do you expect to study depression in humans by using 
brain tissue of animals that suffer from anxiety. Um, so just to follow up, they're marked as different things, even with on the board there. Mm -hmm. And if it's just really anxiety that we can potentially treat with this experiment, I think you've inflated the numbers because anxiety is only 3% of the 24% of psychiatric um, <coughs> victims of disability. So your statistic that this experiment might potentially help 67 million individuals suffering from depression strikes me as problematic, maybe it's because I'm not a scientist, because it seems to me that you're causing anxiety in these monkeys, not depression, and I'm just confused about mm -hmm. how this anxiety study is going sure. to give us any sort of results about depression or accurate results. Yeah, that, that's a very good question, and, and, uh, um, and, and I can't address it. So, uh, again, when, in a short period of time, it's, it's difficult for me to, to provide all the details of these studies. So you're precisely right. Anxiety and depression are not the same. What actually is, is occurring in the case of the peer rearing is that the animals are, are, um, they, they, they are predisposed to an anxious temperament. That in itself isn't anxiety or depression. But that state, and the same state in human children, is, is a highly predisposing factor for the development of, of actual anxiety and actual depression later on. So I was conflating those things a little bit. Um, but the mechanisms, the mechanisms underlying those um, are related to each other. And the kinds of changes that are identified in the brain may have applicability more broadly. Even though if they don't, even though, you know, even if it only treated 3 million people uh, instead of 50 million people, that's still a lot. Um, and, uh, and, and that, I can't really go any further answering that um, because uh, you know, we have to do those studies and find out what we find before we'll know how useful it'll be. But you're right, the, uh, the terminology, uh, they're, they're different. Uh, uh, depression is one of the most common symptoms of an anxious uh, phenotype or an anxious predisposition. And that's really the one that is most problematic. And that is something that we would hope uh, could be treated based on the results of these studies. Thank you. Are these rhesus monkeys or chimpanzees? Rhesus. Okay. Um, local anesthetic or total unconsciousness? For which procedure? For the spinal tap and for the blood sample. Um, general anesthesia uh, uh, or, or sedation. Okay. And how do you plan to use them, euthanize the uh, monkeys? Um, the, the, the monkeys are euthanized with a chemical uh, overdose. How do you imagine the, the mild to moderate anxiety will help those with severe um, disability uh, anxiety? The idea is that, and this is seen in other cases, that the underlying pathway is the same. It's just activated in a more extreme way in very serious cases. So if that's the case, then, and, and you're able to identify the pathway, then you will be able to affect that pathway, whether it's a serious disease or a mild disease. Thank you. I'm going to ask another question that was written down. Um, I think this is related to one of the earlier questions that was asked from, from the mic here. Uh, it says, the babies are killed before the age of two, but depression and anxiety are diagnosed at a later stage most of the time. How comparable are the how comparable are the brain of a baby monkey and the brain of an older human being old, of the age they um, suffering depression and anxiety? Depression and anxiety are severe <coughs> conditions in, in older, in adults, and also in young people as well. So, um, so this isn't by any means just comparing baby monkeys to adults. Um, that said, the, the idea that a single or similar, probably multiple pathways underlie depression in, in young children, in baby uh, rhesus, uh, and in adults, that the pathways will be similar, suggests that if we learn about those pathways in one case, we'll be able to treat the disease in another case. Um, related to uh, this study, you mentioned that um, monkeys, uh, we must use monkeys because they're similar to humans and that rodents are not a useful model because their prefrontal cortexes 
cortices are different. Um, what about, were other models, animal models, between those uh, considered? Mm -hmm. Information is available on the characteristics of anxiety and on the brain structures that mediate anxiety in multiple species. And by far, uh, the, the monkey has the closest structure and function to the human, and that's really why it's been used. Now, that doesn't mean we can't and haven't used other species to get some information, but the question is, uh, is that the whole story? Um, are there other things that we might be able to discover that are relevant to humans using a species that's much more similar to humans. We're not going to know that until we use, uh, until we perform a study like this. My name is Linda McAfee. I'm a student here in the philosophy department. And I heard you speak uh, this afternoon. And one of the other things that struck me was the idea um, of acquiescence. And I understand that, that you were looking specifically at chimps. Yeah. But I wonder if you see that that might have, have any application when looking at other studies and other species. So in addition to the criteria that I um, articulated about um, what would count as necessary research, we also uh, stipulated that the animals needed to uh, be held in captive colonies that were ethologically appropriate, like what they would experience in their day-to-day -day lives, and that the um, individual animals needed to acquiesce to participating in research. So that's a term that um, is not sort of obvious to everybody. What does that mean? And the, the idea is that, um, like we do in human research, we ask people, are you um, willing to participate? We call that informed consent. We can't do that with um, animals that we don't have a way of communicating with. The, the closest parallel that the committee actually tried to think through was the way we think about use of children in research. Uh, so children are not permitted to make decisions for themselves because they're deemed not to be uh, capable. They don't have capacity. But they are, um, it is required that they assent to research, A-S-S-E-N-T. So they agree. And somebody on their behalf consents or makes a decision on their behalf. So the, the parallel for us in the context of chimpanzees was that they needed to acquiesce, which we took to mean um, they didn't object. And if you think about how uh, non-human primate research happens, and I don't know how this works with, with rhesus, but with chimpanzees, you really can't do um, interventional invasive research to them if they don't want you to. They're big and strong, and they have a will of their own. And so when they're given a command and they're trained uh, to present, they'll put their arm through the bar of their enclosure, knowing that that means there's going to be a needle. So whether it's to withdraw blood or inject something to them, they, that they probably don't understand. But they know when they hear the command that something will happen. And in return for their willingness to present, they're often given a treat. There's some kind of incentive. And so the point of our articulating acquiescence was to make clear that we didn't think it was appropriate to um, coerce an animal, whether through force or, as was the case previously, um, if they didn't, uh, if they ran away when they were given the command, they would be tranquilized, they darted, and then brought out of the enclosure and the research performed. We didn't think that that was appropriate. So it was a way of articulating this notion of voluntary participation uh, in a species for which that's, that's a really difficult thing to assess. So to answer your question, that was a long way to get there, but um, does that have applicability to this example? And, and uh, there have been numerous groups now that have tried to take that idea and apply it not just to other non-human primates, but to other animal research subjects on the argument that we, we know more than we admit about how animals react to being put in situations where they have a sense of what will happen to them. And it's, it's easier when we talk to a chimpanzee and tell it to do something or ask it to do something and they do it, but that there are ways of, of reading the responses of even rodents. And so maybe there is some applicability of that approach. It gets to, a, a, in a way, a more consistent approach for how we think about what we're doing when we're asking uh, another individual to put to be put in harm's way for the benefit of, of our health or our knowledge. Um, and that was the motivation um, with acquiescence. It, it's an easier 
concept, although a difficult one with chimpanzees than it would be with rhesus than it would be with other animal um, species, but it's an interesting concept to try to apply. So Eric, have the study started? If you look at the, the long-term picture of what is done in the lab, this is, this is a follow-up to studies that have been going on for many years. Um, and, um, and, and so, the, for example, the understanding of the brain regions that are involved uh, is something that obviously has started, and that is, is a requirement to move forward for this. With respect to the starting of specific studies, that's, that's really not my place to say. That's the sort of thing that the investigator uh, should be uh, uh, asked about and, and answering if, uh, if he feels comfortable doing that. So really, it's, it's, not, my, it's not my prerogative to speak uh, on behalf of uh, uh, that investigator. Can I ask a quick follow-up question? Sure. So the investigator isn't responding to any kind of communication on the subject. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can outline what those concerns might be mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. And if threats are involved, as you've mm -hmm. said before, mm -hmm. when the last threats were mm -hmm. were made. Um, well, yes. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to try to get inside his head. Um, but I know there have been threats to him and to some of the people in his laboratory. And those are continuing. Um, so, uh, and, and I'm actually getting threats. I don't know how many times I've been told lately to rot in hell, um, and, uh, and, you know, via email and uh, sometimes in letters. Uh, so, so I understand the concern that he has. So around, around? About, about basically talking about this uh, uh, in public. He met with you quite extensively and, and answered a lot of questions when you were writing an article. Um, but you know, I respect his wish to to really stand back from this. Uh, I want to give you a chance to clarify or, um, something that you gave in your response um, concerning the benefits of this research. Um, it you know it really came across as though the benefits did not meet that bar that you and your uh, you know committee were setting. Um, you know, I you want to see if these figures. Um, I believe are correct. You know, we're talking about tens of millions of people. Um, you know, one, why aren't they meeting your bar? I want to know, want to know what you know what would make you make that decision. And uh, two, if there's something that I got wrong, you know, I want to give you a chance to clarify that. So I, I think that the question is uh, the way that you um, raised it, and I think the point that you're trying to get me to to revisit. Um, is whether we can draw a, a straight line connection between the research that, um, that we're talking about and the psychi psychiatric health of 23 million, whatever the number of millions of people are. And I think we have to j be careful. Understanding molecular targets in an an a non-human animal model is not the same as having a drug available to treat people with anxiety or depression. There are many steps in between. And uh, I, I think we, we just can't say this is valuable because it will help 23 million people. There are so many steps in between, and it may not help anybody. That's part of the challenge of research. We call it research because we don't know what the answer is. So um, there, there has to be, I think, a, a healthy skepticism about whether we're going to find out things, one, that are valuable, and two, that are going to lead to the kinds of benefits that are being um, purported. And I, I am not actually um, expert enough to know the answer to that question, but I do know that you don't take results from 20 monkeys and claim that you now have a drug to treat 23 million or whatever number of million or even one person. And that's, that's just, um, I think, kind of a, a, a faint, a, a misguided uh, sense of the uh, value of that one particular study, right? Research builds on many years, and you said this is a um, one chapter. You didn't use that term, but it's one chapter in a much longer series of studies, uh, and that's that's the challenge for us. How do we put that in the context of what we call the benefits of research? Yeah, and I'd, well, I'd, I'd sort of like to, to agree with everything you, no, you I, say, I, I didn't think but, but disagree with your okay. conclusion. Okay. Um, uh, so, so what you've described is precisely the, the way research works. So um, 
finding these molecular targets doesn't equal a cure in humans. And, and certainly, that wasn't my claim. What I was trying to do was make a connection for why we should even bother to try to find these targets. If we're just curious about what underlies anxiety and depression in, in monkeys, I don't think that crosses the bar. Mm -hmm. Leave them alone. If we want to understand the process so that we can then do the next experiment and the next experiment and the next experiment that will then get us to a therapy, just as happened with the SSRIs. So we have an example of how that worked. If we want to, if we want to get to that point, we have to do this experiment and the next one. At any place along there, they may not give us answers. We're not guaranteed that it's going to work. Mm -hmm. But the way science works is that often it does work. And the one thing we are guaranteed is that we won't make that progress if we don't get the basic study, the basic science information. And so, and the, so again, it's risky, but I think it's extremely relevant what the long-term objective of these studies uh, is to our decisions right now, because that's why we're doing them. We're not doing them just to find out about molecular So let me, let me try a different way. Um, Generally speaking, the higher the animal, the closer we are to human trials. Would you, would you mm -hmm. grant me that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we, we would want to be fairly certain that we know a molecular target and we are working our way up through from rodents to guinea pigs or whatever the mm -hmm. progression is before we get to non-human primates. And usually that, that is, is held out to be the last step before we go into first in human. Mm -hmm. And the question is whether that's what's happening here. And we haven't had that conversation actually yet tonight. So, I, and I don't know whether you feel like you know the answer to that question, but that would help me speak directly to your question. In the discussions I've had with the investigator and, and in the reading I've done, um, it's clear that a lot is known uh, about a lot of, uh, is known about molecular pathways that that mediate all sorts of um, conditions, including anxiety and depression. Um, information is available from rodents and other species. That hasn't led to, uh, that hasn't given us information that allows us to treat more than a third of the people. So there's a strong rationale for why we might try to get that additional information from the monkey, which is much closer to the humans. What we find there is more likely to be relevant to what's in humans. We can't get it from humans in the same way. Mm -hmm. We also can't get it in humans who, for example, commit suicide. I talked about the, well, for one thing, after death, brain tissue degrades very quickly. Yes, some molecular analyses are possible. Um, the quality of those is suspect. And, and, and similarly, um, someone who, who kills themselves may have had uh, a very serious depressive disorder and, and ended his or her life, or may have had a lifetime of depression and substance abuse and, and ended his or her life. Um, there's not that control, there's not that understanding of what the history is that led to that. It could be environmental, it could be part genetic. So the information we get technically, because the people have died, um, the samples won't be good, and also the history is generally going to be uh, highly variable. Um, and, and I think those are the principal reasons why you would try to use a monkey model, for example, where you can control so many more variables. You still have to decide whether it's worth it or not. But what you'll learn is different than what you'll learn in the yeah. human. I don't know. No, uh, not exactly. I mean, uh, the question, and maybe it's a sort of, the proof will be in what comes next. But if this is basic science research, it doesn't seem to meet the, the test. If this is the last step before we introduce a drug, in a human trial, then that seems to be a more appropriate and justifiable kind of use. And, and I, I guess I would respond by saying that, I mean, you say, if this is basic research, it doesn't meet the test. And, and by doing that, you would rule out every possible well, avenue to getting medications because they all come from basic science. So no, but I think basic we, science with different I think animal we models. Have to, Mm, uh, so well, that's the question. Is this right. an appropriate model for this okay, state of I, research? I, Ask it that way. I agree. Yeah, I understand that. Okay. Um, and, and, and I'm not enough of an expert to definitively answer that. So I that, that, that would help terms. speak to the, to the question that you posed for you me. What point we are in the process. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Rob for a question for Eric. Eric, you went into a fair bit of detail about how you view um, and how you think the committees view the welfare implications 
of both the maternal deprivation as well as the various behavioral and medical tests that are going to be being performed. And it was uh, a very mild picture. Um, part of the reason why I think this uh, research is so controversial is that many people, upon hearing about some of the details, don't believe that it's going to be nearly as mild as you um, painted. Um, my question is a hypothetical one, trying to get at the moral status issue. If you thought that the welfare implications of this were as bad as the critics seem to think it is, would you therefore oppose the research? Um, from a utilitarian perspective, it seems like you would be committed to saying, no, it would still be justified, because the number of humans combined with their greater moral status still far outweighs a small number of animals, even if they're <coughs> suffering a tremendous deal. And if that's right, if that's what you are committed to, some of the, um, the things that you say are being stated as being misleading, like this is not total isolation, which it is not, I agree. But if the official view is that even if it were total isolation, we would still do it, what's the point of those issues? Okay, so there are a couple things embedded in what you've uh, in, in what you've said, and I, I I'll talk about one first. Um, you you mention um, the, the the notion of making the decision based on numbers of monkeys and numbers uh, of humans without consideration of the amount of harm, so that I would perhaps you think I might be forced to make the same decision even if I thought there were greater harm, but that's not how the review process works, and in fact one of the biggest sticking points in the discussion about whether this should go on in the IACUC was, is there a less stressful way to create anxiety than this? So, and, and, and there, there was a lot of discussion and a, and a lot of data presented by the investigator and by some other individuals um, arguing that this for a number of reasons, probably was the appropriate way. It was a well-defined uh, method. If we're trying to back off on the amount of stress, we would probably have to do pilot studies to, to measure that stress, and we'd end up using more animals. Um, certainly, if it had gone in the other direction, uh, and, and, and I would have followed in the lead, too, if it had gone in the other direction saying, oh, we need to make it very serious, I, I don't think it would have been uh, uh, it would have been approved, not so much from the utilitarian balance perspective, but from the balance that that's unnecessary. You don't have to do that. You should minimize the amount of distress that you put these animals through to a point that will still allow you to accomplish your experimental objectives. So that's how I would. But if the researcher came back, say, in two years and said, we yeah, unfortunately, against all odds, mm -hmm. did not answer our experimental objective. Mm -hmm. And in order to do it, we now believe that we do have to put the animals, for example, in total isolation. Mm -hmm. And if you believe that that were really necessary in a narrow sense, that you just, yeah, in order to answer the experimental question, you're going to have to impose this tremendous amount of suffering. According to a utilitarian calculation, it seems like the obvious answer is that this would still be the thing to do. Are, are there any hard limits on the amount of animal suffering that we should be allowing for research purposes? Or is it all up for grace? So you say according to the utilitarian analysis, and remember that's a balance. And, and I didn't say where I thought that balance was. I didn't say if I thought it was close or dramatically different. I believe, given the statistics, as well as given my understanding of what the animals will go through, um, it's acceptable in this case. But the suffering side of that equation <coughs> depends tremendously on what the animals are subjected to. Given, given my own personal perspective, and definitely given what I saw in these committee deliberations, I believe these committees, these individuals, thought that this study was very close to the balance point. If something was proposed to create more pain, that would tip it the other way, and I doubt that it would be approved. And I don't expect I would approve personally of it either. So I think we were closer to the balance point than, than you might have been uh, implying. And, and again, it wasn't also a unanimous decision, um, suggesting again that, boy, we're close to that point. That's how I would answer that. For either of you, both of you, what do you know about alternative funding sources for alternatives that allow us to do less or completely non-invasive procedures or eliminate or 
drastically reduced animal models, or I don't like the word model, animal testing. Um, is the UW pursuing any of this? What's the proportion? And um, if we're not pursuing it, how can I help us do it? Uh, I, I can address that a bit. So of the research funding that comes into the university, uh, total, only 20% of it is associated with an animal care and use protocol. That doesn't mean it's all done on animals, but some part of it involves animals. So we're talking a maximum of 20% of the university research involves animals. Actually, it's the same percent that involves humans, as it turns out. Um, a number of the studies that are being conducted on this campus are specifically looking for alternatives. Certain tests for toxins, like botulinum toxin, are required by the government to go to a point where half the mice in the study die. It's called an LD50 test. Uh, there has been uh, an alternative discovered here that does not require that. Um, so, so yes, the answer, sort of the quick answer is, there are efforts in that direction. The key is to try to match what the, match your experimental system to the question you're as asking. And if you're not, if you don't need to use animals to answer that question, you shouldn't be using animals. And we try to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, let me say really quickly two things. And this came out of the chimpanzee committee work. Um, one, we, we came to the belief that restricting the use of a species actually increases creativity to find alternatives. Uh, and second, that um, you need to encourage the NIH to fund that. So part of the reason we use animals is because NIH funds research involving animals, right? So getting the NIH to, to put money into funding uh, ways to develop alternative testing, uh, alternative ways of doing um, research <coughs> It was included in the recommendations. We'll see whether that pans out. Yeah, my question is about um, those biological markers that you're hoping to find in the uh, rhesus monkeys in their brains. And um, as I understand it, there will be um, medications then developed to help in children, human children, with these anxiety and depression uh, issues. Is that correct in children? So the study is d designed to identify signaling pathways in the brain that underlie anxiety and depression. Once those can be identified, you have the ability, you, 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 have, a, uh, you, you have a target that you can use to try to develop a drug to, to modify it. How that drug would be used, whether it be used in children or adults or sometimes both, it will be entirely decided by physicians. Um, so if, if there was a sense that it was appropriate for some children to receive that, that decision would be made by the physician. Um, but it's not, it's not, that specific use isn't inherent in the study itself right now. That's not a requirement. I'm wondering what your ideal results would be from this study because you say that you can only generally help about a third of the people on psychiatric disability, or at least a third of the people with depression on psychiatric disability. Um, generally, I imagine studies are done looking at specific causes of depression, and many people suffer from many different causes of depression, and you're only studying one cause. Um, are you certain that you can help the two-thirds that are still not very well treated when most studies are done looking at specific reasons like this one is. So, so yes, that's, that's always a concern. Um, will you be able to generalize what you find? So you ask kind of what an optimal outcome would be. Uh, and we see some of this already is the case. Um, given what we know about how SSRIs work, for example. And that is that certain pathways underlie depression that's, that's caused by, by many different things. So multiple causes all track through the same pathway. So if we can target that pathway, and that would be the ideal outcome, find a way to target that pathway, to turn it up if it's too low in depression, to turn it down if it's too high in depression, then that would hold the promise of treating depression for many different causes. Um, if each cause has its own pathway, which is kind of unlikely given the number of causes, 
Um, but if that's the case, then, then you're right. We would only find things that would be specific for a pathway. Probably the truth is somewhere in between, that there are a, a small, a relatively small number, six, eight, ten pathways that are involved, um, and that in different individuals, some will be activated and some won't. The question then would be finding the right drug to, to treat it. The speakers have asked for one minute to provide a closing statement, so to speak. So, Eric, would you like to start? Um, yeah, sure. Um, a, a university um, should be willing to uh, defend the decisions it makes. Uh, so if we are uh, uh, agreeing to conduct certain research here, we should be able to explain why. And that's what I've tried to do today. Um, it gets a little frustrating sometimes when I read things that are so far from the truth. Uh, and, and I know I'm going to continue to read those things because uh, they don't change. There's, there's an agenda there. Um, and, and I really dislike agendas on, on either side of this issue. Uh, of this issue. So uh, what I want to say is I'm very glad that this happened. Um, uh, I'm glad that we were able to raise issues that were of concern, bring in uh, members of the university and members of the public uh, to be part of this. Uh, I'm also glad I didn't have to do the moderating, so thank you very <laughs> much for managing that aspect of it. Um, uh, but but I, I really want to close by saying I, I uh, appreciate the opportunity uh, to have been able to do this. Okay. Um, you know what? I, I second everything that you, you said. Um, I've been very, very impressed by the, um, the tone, the tenor, and the level of um, discourse here. And I, I think there's a, a lot to be um, said for that, frankly. These are really challenging issues, and um, the more transparent and open we can be in discussing them, the, the better off we will all be. Um, I think it's, it's long overdue, frankly, to talk about not specific protocols necessarily, but how we think about the use of animals for human purposes, and that um, getting together and, and conversations like this are a, a really good step in the direction of trying to uh, get to a, a better place. So um, thank you for having me. Great job on your part. And, and thank you for being such a good uh, discourser, whatever the right term is. It's been a pleasure.